All right, well, welcome everybody to uh, this morning's discussion around supply chain and share services issues for a resilient supply chain going forward. Um, we'll get to the topic in a moment. First, some introductions. Dan Shenock, Executive Director of the IBM Center for the Business of Government. We've worked with many of you before, but for those that are, that are new to the center, we're a research team independent of the IBM business. We work primarily with academic experts, uh, several of whom are on the call today who have written for us before, and most importantly, our, our uh, expert author for today and speaker um, uh, at the beginning of the meeting will be Rob Hanfield, and we'll introduce Rob uh, in a moment. Uh, and then we produce these uh, reports coming from our academic partners and our nonprofit partners that we work with to inform government leaders on key issues and challenges of the day. And there is, uh, if uh, uh, you need only read the paper to understand that today's topic is is among the key issues and challenges uh, of the day. And when we, we'd like to say that we had great foresight when we thought of this idea six months ago, that we would uh, have the, the, the topic of the round table be on the, in the newspaper so often leading up to the discussion. Uh, but, but I think um, that events have overseen, overtaken our, our preparation. Um, so we're gonna be talking today about the long-term issues uh, with supply chain uh, management and how do we set up and learn the lessons learned from COVID type supply chain issues and how do we frame uh, a discussion with, with government to inform government, industry, academia as to how to look at this problem going forward. Um, I, I'm fortunate to be partnering in this effort with John Marshall, the CEO and founder of the Shared Services Leadership Coalition. John, over to you. No, thank you, Dan, and thanks to the whole IBM team for pulling together this, uh, this, this illustrious group and uh, framing this discussion. Uh, we uh, thank all of you for participating in what we expect to be a very insightful uh, and exciting discussion. Uh, for those who aren't familiar with SSLC, the Shared Services Leadership Coalition, is a, a nonprofit organization, industry supported. We have about 30 or more uh, IT companies and consulting firms who are our members, as well as as non other nonprofits with similar missions uh, and who support shared services, including the National Academy of Public Administration, the Senior Executives Association, and the Data Coalition. So we're a pretty large uh, and, uh, and diverse group. Um, today, we're here to open up new ways of thinking about how to respond to whole of government management challenges, as Dan mentioned, using COVID as a proxy. And as Rob will uh, help us understand, uh, many government programs can be conceptualized as supply chains. I uh, will be thinking through lessons learned from the COVID response of the last few years and how the lessons could be applied to future challenges in any number of areas requiring information sharing and collaboration in service delivery across agencies and levels of government. We expect to find not, not only new ways to leverage supply chain thinking, but also shared services, moving them out of the back office to frontline mission delivery and particularly ways to support implementation of an ambitious policy agenda of the administration in areas such as climate change, economic growth, uh, responding to the last uh, spike we might have in front of us in COVID, and finally, uh, learning to live with COVID as an endemic. Back to you, Dan. Uh, thanks so much, John. And what we thought we would do, since uh, some of you know one another, but not everybody knows everybody, is just do a quick around the horn um, and uh, if you could just say your name, I I'm going to call you alphabetically. If you could just kind of say your organization uh, and um, uh, your general interest in the topic today, how you how you are associated with this. It could be <clears throat> as an SSLC member, could be as an interested uh, government leader, an academic partner. Sort of what your interest is, association is with supply chain management and thinking about this in a shared services framework. Um, so going by alphabetical uh, first name, uh, I'll go with Al Berman. Hey, uh, good seeing you, Dan and, and John. Um, great to be with you. I'm Al Berman. I'm president of Jefferson Solutions, and we're, we've been involved. Our uh, CEO, Janet Clement, has been heavily involved with the shared services movement for, for a long time. So nice to, nice to see everybody. A lot of good friends here. Thanks, Al. Uh, Christian Hayner. Hi, Christian Hayner, uh, policy director for the House Oversight Committee Minority Staff and the House of Representatives. Um, and mostly here to just listen and gather ideas. Thanks so much for joining, Christian. Dan Finkenstadt. Morning, everyone. Uh, Dan Finkenstadt. I'm an assistant professor at the Naval Postgraduate School. Uh, Rob and I, Rob Tanfield and I, um, worked on the uh, initial COVID-19 supply chain task force response. Great. Ed DeSev. Ed DeSev. I'm uh, director of the Agile Government Coalition. 
at the National Academy of Public Administration. And I think that uh, given what the CFO Council did in talking about the need for an agile financial management workforce, we need to think about bringing agility into the conversation as we promote shared services. I look at the PMA as the what needs to be done, and I look at agile government as the how in implementing things like shared services. Thank you, Ed. James Hasek. Jim Hasek, I'm uh, a senior fellow at the, there we go, sorry, I, here I am. I'm a senior fellow at the Center for Government Contracting at George Mason University. You'll also hear from Jerry again, my boss over there. Uh, I'm interested particularly in questions of industrial mobilization. My particular interest is wartime mobilization, but I think there are obviously a lot of lessons here to be learned. Thank you, Jim. And why don't we go to Jerry? Yeah, hi, I'm Jerry McGinn, Executive Director for the Center of Government Contracting at uh, George Mason. And uh, yeah, I used to I used to run the Defense Production Act in the Department of Defense, which no one knew about until 2020. Um, so I have very keen interest in industrial resilience um, and all matters with regard to that. And please forgive the the flying matter behind me. We're getting our roof replaced, so the, that's that's not the end of the world coming. So just shingles. Well, as as people who have been outside know, it's a really windy day here in DC. Yeah. So there might be things flying around any number of windows behind behind folks today. Um, uh, Jeff Poliak. Good morning, everyone. I am with CGI Federal and prior to that, Sunflower Systems. So I've been deeply involved in the supply chain side of asset management across uh, a good portion of the federal civilian government and a number of government contractors dealing with government furnished equipment and their supply chains. Thank you. Thanks for joining. Lori Cole. Hi, good morning, everyone. Um, I am with the GSA Office of Shared Solution and Performance Improvement, um, really working with the QSMAs as they develop their marketplace within the shared services ecosystem. Um, I come to that role from the DOD working in shared services implementation. So I'll have that lens with me today. Thanks. Thank you, Laurie. Thanks for joining. Mike Peckham. Hey, good morning, everybody. I am Mike Peckham. I am with the Department of Health and Human Services Program Support Center. I am the um, director of the financial man or yeah financial management portfolio and the acting CFO. I have been around shared services since PSC's uh, inception back in 1995, and I loved Ed's comment about how do we become more agile in the government around shared services. I think everybody recognizes that anytime we enter into an agreement. We have to sign forms and lots and lots of forms and no, nothing happens until they're signed. So how can we facilitate, you know, a, a smoother transition in that regard? Thanks, Mike. Great to see you. Uh, Monique Outerbridge. Hi, good, every, good morning, everyone. I'm Monique Outerbridge. I am the HHS account leader for IBM. Um, but prior to that, I was a government employee myself and actually under HHS for about 13 years. And definitely have a very specific interest in not just um, supporting HHS and getting through whatever the, the next crisis is, especially with watching the number of supply chain issues that occurred. Um, but, you know, as a former employee, I, I just have a passion for really trying to figure out what is just the best way of, of being able to approach these issues, particularly around shared services with supply chain. I think that's a, a bit of a twist that I haven't seen in a while. So I'm excited to hear where these conversations go. And, and some good co-creation of thought. Thanks, Monique. Nikki Zimmerman. Everybody, uh, my name is Nikki, and I actually am in our IBM's Global Supply Chain Center of Competency, and I lead our risk and resilience program. Um, prior to that, I led our supply chain and asset optimization offerings within IBM's federal group. Um, so my passion is still with my federal colleagues and seeing what we can do um, to better bring supply chain services and more resilience to the federal supply chain. Thanks, Nikki. Uh, Rob Foster. Hi, I'm uh, Bob Foster. I'm on the minority of the Senate Healthcare Education, Labor and Pensions Committee. Um, before that, I was advising the ASPR at HHS until January, um, which oversees the, as I'm sure you all know, the Chief National Stockpile in BARDA. So I'm really interested to to learn here today. Thank you. Thank you, Bob. Thanks for joining. Stan Solway. 
Morning, everybody. I'm Stan Soloway. I'm president of Solero Strategies. I've been in and around supply chain logistics acquisition issues uh, for almost 30 years, uh, going back to my days at the Department of Defense and look at it through the lens, not only of the national security picture, but also disaster relief, the, the pandemic. Um, I've learned a tremendous amount from Rob Hanfield and his frequent writing partner, Tom Linton. Uh, <clears throat> currently work with a number of companies and uh, talking to a number of agencies about supply chain orchestration and management and uh, very interested in, in bringing sort of new practices to government and the shared services approach certainly is one of them. Thank you, Stan. Steve Goodrich. Hey, everybody. I'm Steve Goodrich. I'm the CEO of the Center for Organizational Excellence. I also sit on John's board for SSLC. And I'm particularly interested in policy, government policy, so that when crises like these hit, we can move quicker. We uh, Not that we always have a uh, something very specific in our tool bag, but we can uh, certainly move quicker on supply chain issues or any other crises that comes up. Thanks, Steve. Tammy Beckham. Hi, good morning. Very nice to be with you today. Um, I'm the director of the Resilient Supply Chain and Shortage Prevention Program at CDRH. Uh, hence my interest in supply chains. And prior to this position, I was actually over at HHS uh, at the beginning of COVID, uh, looking at testing, uh, diagnostics, uh, supply chains, and working the testing aspect of the COVID response. Thank you, Tammy. And I know John Duncan, uh, are you out there? Uh, yes, uh, I'm uh, uh, accessing by phone today. And uh, I uh, work with uh, John Marshall over at SSLC. Thank you, John. Uh, and there's a 202 uh, number that begins with six and ends in four two. Uh, who might that be? Yeah, yeah, this is Bill Womack. I'm with the House Oversight Minority. I work with Christian Hayner. We're here to listen and see what good ideas we can come up with. Thanks so much, Bill. Thanks for joining. Um, and then I think I Got everybody before I introduce our my co-facilitators for the breakout sessions. Is there anybody who who is on who has not had a chance to say hello who's not an IBMer? Uh, good morning. Yeah, Kevin Yule Page. Sorry, I was wrestling with my WebEx. Uh, I, I'm with uh, Deloitte uh, today, uh, but spent uh, spent several years at the General Services Administration, ending my time there as the Deputy Commissioner of the Federal Acquisition Service, where we did logistics, shared logistics operations with DLA. I work with several clients today. Uh, working on government wide supply chain issues. Uh, and so I'm fascinated to participate in this conversation. That's great. Uh, and I think uh, Aisha, did you say hello earlier? Uh, no, I, I apologize. I was having a lot of issues. Uh, hi, I'm Aisha Rahman. I'm with Savannah Solutions. And um, I actually haven't worked in supply chain, but it sounds so intriguing. So I'm really here to <clears throat> learn and listen and. Um, from all the smart people on this panel. So thank you for having me. Thank you for joining, Aisha. And uh, I'm joined by uh, two former government executives who are now working with our center at IBM who are gonna be co-facilitating the breakouts. So let me go to Margie Graves. Good morning, I'm Margie Graves. And as Dan said, I'm uh, uh, fed by, uh, <laughs> by 20 years uh, and just joined the IBM Center for the Business of Government this summer. Um, I have, um, a vested interest in this because I came from DHS and we were responsible for executing the national response plan through FEMA. And we have response and uh, recovery uh, duties that we had to perform. I'm primarily interested in public private partnerships and the application of technology through shared services to support uh, supply chain resilience and uh, particularly interested in some of those emerging technologies like blockchain. Dan, we also have uh, James Wilson with us. Oh, great. Okay. Um, James, are you there? Hey there. Uh, Jim Wilson with M2 Medical Intelligence. Uh, our team um, performs a health security intelligence role where we do watch the world for these kinds of events. Uh, we did provide uh, warning. The situation in Wuhan in uh, December 2019 um, we are a uh, private contractor and uh, do step in to support the government um, based on whatever's going on in the world. Thank you. Thanks so much, Jim. And um, uh, Karen O'Leary, are you there? 
Good morning, everybody. Uh, Karen O'Leary, I'm with IBM and the Center for the Business and Government. I focus on shared services in my center role. Um, and I previously worked uh, for the Justice Department and the U.S. Courts in my uh, government role. Thank you, Karen. Anybody else other than the IBM uh, support team who has not been able to say hello yet? Okay, well, and thanks to Ruth Gordon, Susan Murphy, our three uh, crack note takers uh, who are on the call. Um, uh, so we're supported by a terrific team uh, who will ensure that we capture the, the insights from your discussion. Uh, you noted the, notice that I did not uh, allow Rob Hanfield to introduce himself, and that's because I'm about to give him a glowing introduction. Um, but before uh, I do so, and Rob takes the floor, just a few framing uh, thoughts. Um, Ruth, can you put up the agenda slide um, so that we can... We can just quickly see sort of what we're going to be working on going forward. Um, so uh, after uh, the, these initial uh, remarks, uh, Rob will do about 10, 10 12 minutes, maybe uh, 15, uh, 10, 15 minutes around sort of a framing discussion based on the read ahead that you have received. Um, we'll go through in plenary um, the four questions, if you will. Uh, and um, the first three will really deal with uh, directly. And, and the first question is really a reaction to Rob's session so we'll then go through the next two uh and then we'll break into uh breakout groups based on the information that you gave us and that we sent back to you about which breakout group you received thanks to susan's magic you'll be uh transported without uh much effort uh, into the breakout room uh that'll probably be between like 9 50 and 10 uh, and then we'll bring you back magically uh at about 10 40 depending on when we get started and then we'll have sort of five minute uh, report outs from the from the breakouts to the plenary um, uh, from this information, uh, Rob will take your insights and fold it in, uh, build on the briefing paper that he, he sent his path work for the center that I'll talk about momentarily, uh, and, uh, produce a, a report, uh, that will release with the shared services leadership coalition. Uh, we will all see a version of that report before it goes public. So you'll be able to comment on it. It will be non attribution. We'll be on Chatham house rules today. Um, uh, so no quotes unless you, uh, would like to be quoted and so authorize after seeing the draft. Um, uh, but, uh, otherwise we'll, we'll, uh, look for a candid, open and frank exchange of views. And we're so grateful to all of you for spending a couple of hours with us. Um, the chat function, as you see on the lower, right, I think all of us are now kind of used to the zoom WebEx chat uh, game. And, um, it enables us to really, uh, double, triple, uh, the insights, uh, in terms of what's going on, uh, in the verbal discussion. So feel free to start early and often in, in, um, in contributing ideas to the chat. So before we get to Rob, just a, a few, um, points, uh, to recall from his briefing paper, we're really talking today about a network strategy to address national crises that involve supply chain networks and thinking about do the tenets of shared services apply? How can they be brought in? To a shared network, because a supply chain is indeed a shared network. So what, what about a shared services approach can inform for preparation for and execution of supply chain management in the future? We're at a very opportune time today because just yesterday, uh, all of you management gurus um, in the federal government uh, <laughs> saw that the president's management agenda vision was announced. And it had several components that are very relevant to our discussion today. Among them, a priority for managing service delivery across agencies, um, uh, uh, prioritizing shared products, services, and standards for excellent service delivery, um, fostering improvements to the acquisition system. Um, and in the private sector, as, as many of us uh, in, in companies know, acquisition and supply chain are, are relatively synonymous in terms of, of how, how private sector companies approach them. Uh, and then uh, directly talked about building capacity for funding supply chains in, in um, uh, priority area three of the management agenda. So very much a focus of, of the management agenda going forward. Uh, OMB is interested in our discussion. I know we're, we're of course fortunate to be joined by several colleagues from uh, Capitol Hill offices. Um, so our work will be uh, read by, by multiple uh, interested leaders in government. Um, Rob, as you saw from the uh, email, is sort of taking a lessons from COVID view as John talked about earlier. Our center has reported on some of these lessons in a recent paper by Don Kettle, the uh, renowned public management scholar, and Rich Green and Catherine Derrett, two leading state and local commentators who wrote uh, about COVID response and recovery and talked about supply chain management is part of the lesson that government needs to go forward to. It's sort of almost a setup for today's discussion. 
And then Rob has written for us before. Um, Rob wrote a report after the H1N1 epidemic about um, supply chain approaches to preparing for future crises. So um, uh, very much top of mind in thinking about uh, response from COVID going forward. And then Rob wrote a paper for us about a year ago in a report we did on various essays around supply responding to COVID response and recovery, where he talked about a concept of supply chain immunity um, and uh, developing uh, uh, sort of hardening the supply chain in different ways that he'll, he'll talk about. Um, so really, we're here today to talk about you know, can an orchestrated approach, a whole of government approach to supply chain be developed? What are its characteristics? We're not going to solve the whole problem by 11 o'clock, but hopefully with your insights, we'll have some framing information, some questions to ask, um, insights to share uh, around these, these issues. And then finally, some of you may be asking, well, what's the, what are some shared services elements that can be uh, uh, appropriate for, in terms of supply chain management? What's the real connection beyond the sort of the top line? And John and Rob and I and our team have talked through a number of, of, of ideas here. One is, of course, data standards, um, which is um, something that is called out for in uh, President Biden, one of President Biden's recent announcements around uh, uh, improving supply chain, sort of having shared data standards. And, of course, that's a key element of the shared services strategy and governance. Shared governance across participation, which is um, something that uh, we've seen build up over a period of years in the, in the lines of business and now the QSMOs. Uh, centers of excellence. Um, participants in the supply chain, may one, of, one participant may do something very well, better than others, and maybe that participant can, can take up some of that production facility uh, in a networked uh, uh, capacity kind of, kind of approach. And then finally, emerging technology, the adoption of new technologies that can promote data sharing, distributed analytics, blockchain, artificial intelligence, um, all of those are sort of fusing shared services and of course can be re very relevant into, in terms of supply chain. As I said earlier, we're not here to talk about how do we address the problem that is on the front page of the paper this week. So if you have ideas for hiring more truck drivers, we're the wrong people to tell. I can, we can probably give you people that are better able to, to do that hiring. Um, we're here to really think long-term about what are the systemic factors that we can contribute to building a more resilient supply chain uh, in the future. So thank you for coming into it with that spirit. Um, thank you for volunteering for the breakout groups as well on supply chain issues and process, supply chain technology, and supply chain policy, and we'll be we'll be moving into those in uh, about uh, 30 minutes time. Uh, so, uh, with that framing, uh, let me now introduce Rob. Rob is, uh, Hanfield is the professor of supply chain management at North Carolina State University. He's also teaches on supply chain management at Manchester Business School in uh, England. Uh, he's also the director of the Supply Chain Research uh, Corporation, which is an independent uh, uh, industry university partnership. Uh, that uh, uh, enables uh, folks to come together to think about supply chain issues, uh, bring students in, uh, importantly, to uh, for their work around supply chain. Rob's also the editor of the Journal of Operations Management, a prominent um, uh, publication in the supply chain field, and he's been the author of several supply chain management books, the author and co-author. He's a frequent speaker and writer on the topic. He has had more opportunities in the last few weeks to testify and to answer the phone than I think he may have been ready for. Um, uh, but we're very fortunate that he's taken uh, time out of his work to be with us this morning and to write the follow-on report. So, Rob, thanks so much for joining, and I'm going to turn the, the virtual podium over to you. Hey, thanks, Dan. <clears throat> so, um, th this is kind of my uh, my dream group of, of people I've we've been able to assemble here, and really want to thank you all for showing up this morning. I'm really excited about the possibility of uh, doing a really hard think today on this problem. Um, as Dan mentioned, um, you know, the title of my report I wrote in 2010 for IBM was planning for the inevitable, which, uh, sure enough, you know, it, it did come. Come true and, uh, we, we had this incredible pandemic. And, uh, you know, I was, I was, uh, brought on board. Uh, courtesy of Dan Finkenstein, who's on the call with us today. To, as a uh, pro bono consultant for the joint acquisition task force. And uh, prior to that, I've had experience working with GSA and, and the VA. So I'm, I'm familiar with uh, government, how government works. I'm on the faculty at the George Mason, Mason Center for government contracting as well. And, you know, in my position, I'm able to talk to a lot of different people, many of whom are on the call today. 
And, uh, you know, during this, this pro bono uh, uh, gig that we did between March and June, you know, we, we spoke at length with several members who worked in the strategic national stockpile. We worked with people who worked in, uh, in hospitals uh, at DHS. And, and we, we really understood, got to understand what was going on in terms of the, the, the lack of coordination, I would say, not only uh, within the SNS, but across agencies within government. And that, that led me to, you know, talk to Dan further about pulling together a group of people that are really smart and really know a lot about not just government, but supply chains. And, and try to do a think about how to, how to fix this current problem that we have today. Next slide, please. You know, one of the things that really struck me um, as we started, uh, you know, working with the strategic national stockpile and, and as we know that the outcome of COVID was uh, more US deaths than, you know, the three last wars combined, more than half a million people died. And, um, you know, people sometimes like to point their fingers at the SNS, but, uh, you know, I, I want to, and I said this in my testimony to the Senate as well. Um, you know, the, the people working with the SNS, they, they work really hard. They, they put in long hours as they tried to react what was really an untenable situation. And so any critiques that I have here are limited to the design of the strategic national stockpile, as opposed to a direct criticism of the people working within it. And I think it's important to understand a little bit about the history of the SNS. Next, next slide, please. You know, the, the strategic national stockpile was somewhat of a secret organization. They, they really didn't publicize what they did. And the genesis of the organization really was on bioterror, not pandemics. So it was never designed or intended to be able to respond to a pandemic such as COVID. And the majority of the people working within the SNS were inventory logisticians, not supply chain logisticians. That means they did not have experience in managing warehouse, transportation, acquisition. They really didn't have any kind of uh, market intelligence about supply lines. Um, they managed about 800 product lines and much of their time was spent focused on how to spread out what they had, what were very limited funds on acquiring materials to cover threats. And, and the threats themselves were often determined by HHS to determine what to invest in. And this was a very, you know, public health science view of potential scenarios that, that might arise, had little to do with supply and demand for products. The composition of what actually went into the SNS was largely determined by the FEMKE, the Public Health Emergency Medical Countermeasures Enterprise, which issued a strategic plan outlining the key areas for inventory investment. And number one on that list was $5.7 billion for pandemic influenza, which included development of vaccines with BARDA, as well as replenishment of expiring materials. This was an excellent plan for the FEMP. However, it was allowed to languish and in 2018 was not restarted. And, and this was tragic because I believe we would have been in a much better place if that had been carried out. For instance, the supply of N95 masks in the SNS consisted of inventory acquired during the 2009 SARS epidemic. And obviously those were expired and useless by the time uh, COVID rolled around. So, you know, we, we really had to rethink uh, what the design is of the SNS and, and what its, its purpose is. Next slide, please. The, the current structure, you know, and again, it's, it's been part of the CDC for more than 10 years and the last two years was transferred over to ASPR as part of the HHS. I don't think this was really the right place for it to reside. As again, it reported up to medical scientists, not emergency response agencies. What made it worse was that their leader, uh, Greg Perel, great guy, very capable. He retired in November, 2019. They did not even have a deputy director assigned and therefore was leaderless. Uh, they didn't have enough warehouse capacity. There was little precedence for them to store products and sell them to the market. And much of the inventory they did have went to waste and had to be given out. Um, despite this, there were early indications. The SNS did have early indications. On January 29th, they issued what they 
they called an analysis of logistics summary or ALS. And it asked for a response from key distributors who all responded. And this was Cardinal McKesson. Every one of them said they were on allocation of PPE on February 1st from all of their suppliers in China. They also informed uh, the SNS that they heard, heard China was nationalizing product and they were experiencing an inability to get transportation to the ports. By February 3rd, all of the distributors were being slammed with requests for PPE, which they did not have. One of the quotes I recall from that time is someone at the SNS said, I was shocked at how many manufacturers and distributors have so little visibility into, into their tier two, three, and four suppliers. The members of the SNS uh, spoke to leaders of the chain of command, but again, these were scientists and scientists unfortunately don't understand how supply chains operate. And despite uh, an SNS briefing on predicting what would happen, they were not listened to. By March, the DPA was enacted, which was much too late by that time to obtain uh, uh, equipment and supplies and many, many distributors themselves could not get product out of China. So, so this, this led to the free for all that I don't have to go into, into detail on, but, you know, have, let it be remain to be said that I don't think everyone had the right, the right, the right people on board. Um, I should just add also that they have added an acquisitions branch to Asper, uh, which has been added more recently. Uh, we're not clear as to, you know, any other details about what, what other things have been done here. Next slide, please. Um, it's important to also understand that, you know, the SNS, like any, every other government agency operates within a very complex ecosystem. Uh, their, their critical medical supplies are, are produced, obviously, from raw materials, durable equipment, but there's other supplies that are really required that were in short supply during uh, COVID. Notably, uh, cert certain uh, intubation drugs like propofol, uh, obviously vaccines. Um, and not only is there really no supply strategy, but there isn't an allocation strategy. So the SNS did, you know, was not equipped to be able to figure out how to allocate limited supplies across states. Do you do it by hotspots? Do you do it by population? So there, there really wasn't a, a notable approach for how to distribute required goods. They deal with a lot of different stakeholders, you can see here. One of the things I will say is, is during that crisis, they were unable to really coordinate across agencies between the FDA and the CDC and ASPR, uh, they were not even able to get access to details on a uh, number of, of cases or, uh, you know, other details that they needed. So, so the, the, the singular lack of coordination is something I think that we can really talk about today uh, and hopefully address. Next slide. So one of the, some of the things that we observed, um, you know, I, I'm not going to go through all of them here, but, you know, let it be said that, you know, I think there was a singular lack of federal level market intelligence and transparency that, that they did not, they could not see what they were buying. They could not see the level of inventory in the system. Um, they, they lacked even simple barcode systems to be able to track the current expiration dates and what they had in these warehouses. Um, so, so clearly there's, there's, there was a lack there. There was a, a lack of an early warning system. And I, I've asked, you know, James Wilson to be here today because he, uh, you know, he, he, uh, works with, with, uh, medical intelligence. And I think there were some very early indications that there was an emerging pathogen in China. And in my mind, I think that's, that was a key missing gap to be able to understand how do you get these early indicators of potential medical threats? And then how do you pull them into a supply market analysis and take that supply market analysis and start to deploy uh, inventory and materials? So, you know, I, I think we need to be rethinking how to, how to pull information from, um, from all these different sources and, and pull them together. And, and I think the shared services rubric is a good way of doing that. We also see that, uh, you know, th there wasn't a, a lot of, of uh, insight into uh, future predictive analytics. 
you know, there, there wasn't really any war gaming that would allow us to be able to say, well, what happens if there's a pandemic and we, or there's another, you know, emergency of this scale? What, what would we require uh, under what conditions of, of the spread of the, these pathogens? Uh, what would that look like? We know a lot of the pathogens came over through air transport. They came into major cities like Las Vegas, Chicago, LA, New York. Uh, so, so, you know, there needs to be coordination amongst the intelligence around the medical side, the clinical uh, transmission of these pathogens and the supply chains that can support them. Next slide. So, I think some of the major issues I want to talk about today is, you know, how do we deal with supply shortages? Uh, how do we deal with, with governance? So, I think technology uh, is part of this. We need to have material visibility across the SNS, across FEMA, across state procurement offices. As part of our study, I also interviewed every uh, chief procurement officer from every state in the country. Actually, not everyone. I think it was 47 that we covered. But what we found by and large was that state procurement offices are not prepared to deal with pandemics. So, and they were forced to try to you know, purchase outside of uh, the country, you know, with, with suppliers in China. And, and many of them had never done this before. Many of them had never you know, developed contracts outside their own state. So, so state, there needs to be a, an allocation strategy for states to be able to coordinate with the, uh, the federal government. And, and the fact that we are still relying on primarily overseas suppliers and are beholden to export policies and priorities of other nations. I think there's some geopolitical issues involved here as well. And uh, I know we've seen some, uh, you know, recent uh, executive orders from the Biden administration to try to bring some of these products back to the United States. Unfortunately, what we are seeing is that these domestic PPE manufacturers are being told their prices are too high relative to the Chinese suppliers. And they're going bankrupt, if you can believe it or not. We're falling right back into the arms of the Chinese and we're not buying domestic supplies. I think that needs to change. I think the federal government could change that. Uh, there's generally disparate means of communication, coordination amongst the agencies. I like the idea of having a, a center of excellence that maybe can do that. Having a, a, a response system that has strategic sourcing, forecasting, planning capabilities, analytical capabilities. And then uh, really having a, a better strategy for visibility into what's happening in hospitals in our healthcare supply chain. And finally, I think, you know, we saw federal agencies were competing with one another over their decision rights and ownership of issues. So I think understanding that, you know, an equitable and fair means of deploying materials uh, and, and avoiding these random, you know, politically motivated allocations is necessary. We need to have governance around some of these issues as well. Next slide, please. So what what we're going to do, and again, you know, these are these are just suggestions as we think there's there's a need for a some kind of a virtual living stockpile, we call it. The idea and when I talk about supply chain immunity, it's that idea of of uh, you know, thinking about different ways of allocating inventory. One way, perhaps, would be through the VA. VA has distribution centers and warehouses located across the country. Uh, we had a call with a, a member of the VA last week, and uh, there's there's real interest in pursuing that that avenue of uh, creating a living stockpile using existing distribution uh, resources that belong to the federal government. Uh, the DOD may be, uh, you know, another another area. I think the Air Force has generally been known as having the strongest acquisition skills. So maybe there's a there's a DOD component here as well for managing uh, part of this uh, this stockpile, making sure that the expiration dates are are reviewed and that that material goes back into the market. Uh, and I think there's also clearly a role for distributors. Who collectively have very strong market intelligence of what's going on in these markets. Uh, I've been interviewing hospitals for the last uh, couple of months about what their supply chain resilience plans are. Uh, they've been pretty weak. Uh, most of them do not have strong resilience plans in place, and and they're talking about how to develop those. So, 
we need to think about our hospital supply chain and our distributor supply chain here as well. So what are we gonna ask you to do? Next slide, please. Um, you know, we wanna, we wanna think about what are the characteristics of a national threat response system? And, and you know, that includes, you know, medical threat signal analysis, uh, understanding of our supply market signal analysis, also the clinical interpretation of these supplier requirements through what if analysis tabletop scenarios, and then some type of a national healthcare monitoring system. <clears throat> um, today, I think distributors have some some level of of this in place, but um, it really is not well coordinated at a at a federal level. So in the breakouts, and we can go to the next slide. What we what we're asking people to do is to consider these four questions in the breakout groups. What were the major performance problems that occurred that did occur? What was the, the current state, if you will, um, and uh, wh what was missing? What, what were the capabilities that were missing? Uh, what are the capabilities that could have addressed this, these gaps? Uh, what would a world-class commercial set of capabilities look like, including shared service strategies and attributes of those capabilities? And how do we move to that? What would be the enabling elements to be able to develop and move to this capability? So uh, I, I see there's been some great uh, chats already and, and suggestions, and I love that because uh, we've got, as I said, some really intelligent experts in the room, and we want to be able to collect your thoughts as much as possible here in the next little while and, uh, and get you to, uh, to, to share your ideas about what that would look like. Uh, we've, we've put you into three different breakout groups. Um, next slide. Uh, so the breakout groups are, first of all, uh, supply chain issues. So global independence, persistent and agile markets. Uh, you know, what are, what are the issues? That, what's the current state? What's the future state? And how do we get there? Uh, supply chain technology. How do we enable greater transparency and traceability to be able to determine you know, what's out there, first of all, and uh, what is our ability to deal with that? And how do we build some predictive models around it? And then finally, government policy issues. How do we leverage our current capabilities? How do we ensure the right coordination? Uh, how do we uh, do so respecting constitutional roles and responsibilities? And how do we create uh, both the political and the operational means to be more uh, visible and, and more sustainable? Dan, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you, Rob. What a terrific set of framing remarks. Um, thanks so much for opening uh, that floor and uh, thanks to Dan for starting the ball rolling on the on the chat. Um, feel free to continue that before we go into the breakout groups. We wanted to talk as a plenary team uh, a little bit about, especially sort of that 1st question in terms of framing the issue uh, in terms of how Rob presented the stockpile issue and, and uh, challenges that were uh, uh, that incurred. Uh, what other elements um, should we be considering in that framing? And then um, uh, in terms of current state, are there, were there other kind of sort of capabilities from a general frame uh, before we get into the specific breakouts? And I'm going to look for hands on, if you use the raise hand function on the Zoom, feel free to do that. I'm sorry, on the WebEx, feel free to do that. Or you can just wait and I'll keep my eye on the screen uh, and, um, uh, and look for your hand. So, um, you want to start? Let's see. I see, uh, Kevin, go ahead. Yeah, I put a chat in there. I, I, something excellent presentation. Thank you. Uh, I, what I didn't see mentioned among the list of current capabilities is the war stopper program that DOD runs. And, uh, and so that's kind of a, I think of it as a civilian air reserve fleet concept for critical war supplies. Uh, and I think they're, I think it's basically an authority they have to commandeer supplies that would. That are necessary for, for, for the conduct of their operations. And I, I believe it applies also to the medical uh, arena but beyond and beyond. Uh, so I think, I think there's a, there's some concept of the authority of the government to reach into commercial. Uh, into commercial agreements and and commandeer supplies. And so I'd love to see how that fits in or should fit into a, a future state. Great other thoughts about. Gaps, additional capabilities, questions for Rob. Okay. Stan. 
Yeah, I, th I think it'd be good, you know, when we when we uh, break out, I think, um, you know, we really want people to, to really, you know, think creatively about what would that future state look like. And um, it's okay to throw out, you know, crazy ideas at this point. You know, we're really looking to see, uh, you, you know, what, what we could do. Also, if there's something that's already there, you know, we're not experts. I'm certainly not an expert in all the different branches of government. Uh, and we may want to think about, you know, other legislation or bills that are out there that that might support this, or maybe there's something today in that massive infrastructure bill that, that would support this as well. So. Thanks, Rob. Stan. <clears throat> Stan, were you waving? I can hear you, Stan. You're on mute. Sorry about that. We think I'd figure that out after a year and a half. Um, like a lot of others on this call, I've had the chance to read a, a lot of Rob's work and had a chance to talk to him in the past. And, and Dan, we've talked about these issues. I, and I, I love the framing that, that Rob gave us. But I did make a note that it, it seems to me that as we approach the issue, one characteristic, characteristic that we ought to apply or a lens we ought to apply to everything is what's realistic versus aspirational. Um, and Rob, when I, you look, for instance, your national threat model and, and so forth, and you think sort of enterprise level, the reality is, and, and I'm just saying, throwing this out, the idea for the, and I, by the way, your idea of the Air Force getting involved is great because of their acquisition capabilities. But if you go to the, the Air Force folks, they're going to go, whoa, we can't necessarily handle this. And I think we need to think of it in pieces and how we can then knit the pieces together at the top, as opposed to thinking of one large piece of architecture, if, if that makes sense. Because I think we will spend years and years trying to break down silos to get people to work together in a different way and may have more success in taking piece by piece with common architectures in each piece and the ability, sort of if you think of a military perspective, sort of an interoperability approach, as opposed to sort of one national strategy and a and centralized or too federalized an approach. Um, you know, Ed made the comment when he was introducing himself, I mean, this does scream out for agility. And um, when the work I've done in the last, particularly the last five years in supply chain, the commercial models uh, would certainly lend themselves to that. So I just suggest that as we talk about it, we think of it in the piece parts, not necessarily a hundred piece parts, but significant piece parts and attack each of them individually and figure out how we interoperate rather than thinking about doing it across the board as one, one fell swoop. Mm -hmm. um, Ed, could I ask you to comment also putting on your hat as the former leader of the Recovery Act program who wrote a lessons learned for the center on that as well? Um, I'd like to take a slightly different approach to that. First of all, I think Stan's idea of not trying to create a, a, an overall superstructure in the government, it gets really crazy when you try to do that, but rather to focus on pieces is a really good idea. And I want to comment briefly on the President's Management Agenda vision that came out. Um, it's very different than other PMAs that we've seen. It doesn't have any stoplights in it and so on. Um, but what it focuses on is what should be done. The workforce should be made better. Um, customer experience should be improved for families and communities. Um, management should uh, support climate change and domestic manufacturing and so on. Those are all laudable goals, but what's lacking is the how, how we do it. And I think that the idea of procurement and supply chain management fitting within the management structure, because what it talks about first in management and the management agenda is buying. Um, it doesn't define buying. It doesn't talk about uh, interoperability or, or systems. Or if, did we lose that? I lost him. Okay. I lost him too. Um, all right. Um, we'll come back to Ed when his when his bandwidth comes on. Al Berman. Uh, you know, I really like uh, like uh, Stan's suggestion in terms of being able to do these things somewhat independently and not trying to you know kill all the silos at once. But I would think one of the major issues is just being able to get the information needed as to who's doing what and communicating that uh, throughout the enterprise and. We, we were involved in some of those issues when we were looking at uh, trying to bring sort of uh, a Western procurement 
system when the Soviet Union fell apart. And as I was procurement administrator, we tried to find out who was doing what overseas. And I think there were 30 agencies doing procurement stuff, many of the things we didn't even know about going on. And so being able to take that challenge on, I think is a pretty important part of this process or will be. Thanks, Dan. Mm -hmm. Sure, we, it's interesting. We had a discussion that Stan Solway was in earlier this week around a report that Stan and Jason Knudsen, a former DOD executive, uh, did on other transactions authorities, um, uh, which is, as many of you know, is a, a procurement technique sort of outside the FAR to promote innovation. And one of the concepts that Jason brought up was this idea of using OTAs as a driver for doing out what you talked about, about driving toward a future state of operation. He, he called it um, sort of acquisition to enable 21st century warfare in that context. But I think more broadly, your point uh, talks about, can we reframe government acquisition to support this concept of a resilient supply chain, um, which is very directly on point here. Uh, great discussion in the chat. Keep that coming. Any other uh, comments generally from, from the group? I see, um, I think I see Jerry, go ahead. Yeah, hi, uh, thanks, uh, Dan. Um, I'm gonna find myself agreeing with Stan, which is kind of rare, um, but the, um, uh, I think, you know, uh, grant strategies sound great, but they are just never work, and particularly in government. So I think setting up some broad frameworks, and here there's a couple of natural ones. I mean, FEMA is one, and then uh, the DPA is, is another, um, like the, the, the set of, Title Seven agreements that started to be developed um, that it, it, towards the end of the, the, the Trump administration. I'm not sure where they are today. Those are the kind of the broad frameworks that that I think would be helpful. But you, then you have to do it as the pieces. You know, like if Asper, you know, as Rob's presentation showed, if if Asper is the wrong place for the the SNS, then we should then we should move it, right? So so I do it in that. In, um, where you've set broad principles and then um, adjust the federal approach to do uh, um, 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 for each piece. And the second thing is, I, I would like to see more of the um, in this effort of, of uh, you know the commercial business practices, um, um, you know, just in time manufacturing, those kind of things. Glo the globalization that you know optimize manufacturing for um, you know is. is you know, has led to some of the conditions that we're we're dealing with, um, where production is overseas, and we can't we can't buy America our way out of this, um, in my view. But we sort of have to prioritize, and I think that's something that um, uh, we have to, you know, because even the Biden administration and frankly most administrations talk out of both sides of their mouth. They want they want to build they want to buy strong by America, but they also want to partner with allies, and so you've got to find ways to square that. Um, and, um, you know, and, you know, and so we've got to not, we can't just buy everything, build everything in America, but we also got to figure out how to, you know, what's the right balance. Thank you. I, Jerry. I would agree with that, Jerry. I think, I think, you know, we need to have a stopgap strategy and you know, maybe it's 10% of, you know, of federal acquisition needs to be domestic so that if we are cut off in the middle of a pandemic where we have some, you know, stopgap measures, we have capability inside the country. Interesting policy point. All right, Ed Desev is back, and either there's bright sunlight in front of you, Ed, or you're ready to talk. Um, yes. <laughs> I apologize that you, the gremlins always get us, you know. Um, I want to agree with the last two speakers and say that that is that, and I apologize, both sides of the mouth. Well, we, we don't talk that way when we're dealing in political terms, gentlemen. What we talk about is having multiple objectives, you see. <clears throat> in any event, Buying it can be related within the president's management agenda to quote an industrial strategy. And I think to the extent that we promote the industrial strategy concept and link it to buying, we're exactly as the last two speakers said, in the right place. We're in the place where we can demonstrate the use of strategic agile supply chains to promote domestic manufacturing and also to link into global supply chains, which are the future. So I, I, I think that's where we are at this point. Thanks, Ed. All right, any final uh, comments for the plenary group before we go into breakouts? Looking around, uh, yes, Stan. Yeah, sorry, just one last comment. I think, and, and, and I'm not sure who said this very early on before Rob gave his presentation. Um, 
but there's there's across the pandemic this, we're not just talking about material movement that was a supply chain issue um, if you look at the struggle we had of getting benefits to people and you back off that and think about the patchwork of federal programs that deliver a variety of benefits it's ultimately a supply chain management type of issue i mean there's there's a tremendous there's a real analogous crisis there so as we think about this i think we've been thinking about federal benefits programs and how the same kinds of concepts that we're applying to materiel can be applied to how we actually get support to people uh, through that same kind of complex network. And the last thing I was going to say, and I apologize for, for going on here, is from a messaging perspective, for any, if nothing else, I think we had to start with a set of really obvious gaps. And I, I know one of the work, one of the um, breakout sessions is going to do this that we saw not only in the pandemic that we see all along. And the one I always harp on is when there's a natural disaster, three of the major uh, organizations involved are DLA, FEMA, and the American Red Cross, and they have no interoperability between their systems. So they have no idea what's in each other's warehouses. They have no idea what each other's moving. I mean, even basic stuff like that. Thank you, Stan. And I fully concur on sort of the overall framing, as, as Rob said, you know, you, and you said earlier, everything can be thought of in a supply chain context, and, and uh, certainly a shared services kind of strategy can help enable that, um, which is, I think, maybe a good point, uh, unless I, I see any other thoughts um, uh, here. Yes, uh, let's see, I see two more. I see Lori, and then Mike. I'm just, um, based on what Stan was just saying, and it was in my mind earlier, it's like when you're talking across federal, state, local, they're all involved in this situation, um, having that common framework to be able to share information. So it's really just reinforcing what Stan said. How do they share that and be able to benefit from, you know, the understanding of what's available and how to get it and understanding that interoperability across these different levels of government too. Thanks, and that's a really important point. We, when we talk about whole of government, we, we often think of that as whole of federal, but it, it definitely involves the intergovernmental partnership. Mike. Hey, um, thank you, Dan. So as a government in, in my history, we've always been reactive. And even in the most recent um, exercises that we performed at HHS under Reimagine, the majority of the work is reactive. If you take buy smarter, for example, we're analyzing our past buys to say, what's our best price that we could get for surgical gloves? But those are past buys. Is that price still relevant today? I mean, this is, this is looking backwards. We're being reactive. We need to be more proactive and we need to be thinking, I hate to throw it out there, um, similar to Amazon. If we're gonna talk about the strategic nuclear stockpile and we're gonna talk about um, you know, the capabilities we have through PSC at Perry Point and drug shipments we have there, to me, that's what we have in warehouse. That's what we should we should know at, at the snap of a finger what we have. But we've also have to build the partnerships in the acquisitions world. And I'll start with goods. You can't go full blown across the, 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 the model on this. But if you think about goods, when somebody gets registers on SAM, they're registering for particular activities. So if they're registering for goods, we need to set up that common architecture so that they can then give us a listing of what the goods are. If you take, for example, the recent problem we've had with getting um, screens, just you know, uh, um, regular computer screens, there has been a massive shortage. And what I see my folks doing is calling around to different vendors to find out where the supplies are. If we take the proactive approach where the inventories are being listed, when, when they're, they're being linked, when they're being listed on SAM, we can look downstream into the inventories to understand we don't have to make phone calls. We can go to the vendor who has them. We may not be paying the lowest price, which is exactly what's going on right now, but at least we know where the goods and services could be provided from. So that's just my two cents going into this entire thought process. Thank you, Mike. Anything else before we have the magic carpet ride into the breakout groups? All right, so uh, uh, let's see, Monique, was that a comment or did you read? No, okay. Um, oh. Yes, okay, we have one from Nikki. Yeah, hey Dan, I just wanted to jump on what Mike was just talking about, um, and I, and I think that what you're talking about that plays so well into a shared service. Um, we were actually talking to Gardner about a month ago, and they said the number one thing organizations globally are looking for, and that's both in the commercial space and the government space, is a 
a center kind of a shared service like what you're look you're talking about for supply chain and for resiliency so i mean this is what i'd say the whole world is working on right now and what the whole world is asking for um and thankfully what we've seen over the past two years in government space is innovation and technology and processes advancing probably 10 years fold in the in a, in a time of a, in a two-year period right the amount of innovation that's occurred around um, the vaccine and the rollout of it and the advancements in what we've been doing in supply chain um, has been crazy and it's been something that we've never seen before it's just now we're having to redesign and rebuild what we've been working on for the past 30 years and leaning our supply chains the world is flat the globalization and how do we localize it and then how can the government take advantage of that and support it and push it even further ahead faster right um and i, I think it's great you're seeing it not just in the federal space but also in the healthcare and life sciences space exactly where you're living um, I'd say they're moving faster than others right now. Thank you, Nikki, for bringing both the global perspective and also the good point about the healthcare and life sciences discussion, which is very similar to um, to this one. And I've seen a number of forums there. All right. So I think what we're going to do now is uh, uh, Susan will put. You'll see a button on your screen that says "Go to this group." Um, uh, you may have to click on it to go, and uh, we'll go for forty minutes. So let's say. 1043 um, uh, or thereabouts. Feel free if you need to take a quick stretch break. Uh, you know, you can decide that amongst yourselves as a group. Uh, and uh, Margie, Karen, and I will facilitate. We're enabled by our excellent note takers. And then we'll come back and we'll do report outs uh, in the last 15 minutes of the meeting so that we can kind of hear what you just talked about. All right, Susan, can you take us away? I can take you away. See you later. See. Susan? He should be going in. I thought I was policy. Um, I can I can move you. Who is Margie Margie's technology, is that correct? Margie's technology. Okay, yeah, I have technology on my screen. I've got technology on my screen too, and I thought I was gonna be in uh, policy. I mean not not, not policy, um process. All right, that, that was my fault. I apologize, you guys. No problem. Is that just um, us, our team, Ruth? That that problem happened? Yeah, yeah. It's just you guys. Okay. All right. So Dan, Dan, you're go. You want to go into policy? Yes. Okay. And John. A uh, process. Uh, process isn't government policy issues. Is that the no, one? not not policy nor technology. The the the, the other one. Supply the issues. Chain, supply chain issues. I guess that's it. Yeah. Okay. Here you go. Okay. James, which um, which breakout session did you? I think I was supposed to be in policy. In I'm a policy guy. Okay, let me just assign you. All right, and then we have John. John Duncan, is that you? Yes. Oh, yes, I'm on. And you will assign me to uh, whatever group you want. Um, John, I think you're already in one because I don't. Yeah. Can he go to one if he's a call? Like I see. Okay, so, so you'll move me over, right? Um, I'm not seeing you on my screen. Um, okay. Well, I'm coming in by audio. You can't you can't go into a breakout via audio. Oh, oh okay. Then I'll I'll just join from your computer. I'll just stand by and pick up when the plenary starts again. Okay. And and I I, I dropped the ball with Lev. Lev, did you, did you choose a? I, oh, there you are. You emailed me. Um, supply chain technology, Susan. If you could put Lev there. Yes. Thank you. Okay. Um, so where is Rob Hanfield? He's in supply chain technology. See where he is in. 
Wait, so he's in policy. He's in policy. Okay, great. Mm -hmm. Okay, so Rob. Okay, so Dan and Rob are in policy. John Marshall is in supply chain issues. Oh, there's Rob. Rob, you're on mute. Hey, could you put me over in the supply chain issues? Sure. Just give me a moment to locate you. Sure. Okay, so you're going to be in with John Marshall then? Yeah, yeah that's fine. Uh, okay. Why am I not seeing you on this list, Rob? Just go, give me a moment. I apologize. Yeah, I'm assigned to the government policy issues group that they want. Oh, I see. Okay. And you want to go into supply, supply chain, chain issues. Okay, here you go. All right. Thanks. Okay, so then uh, uh, there's a bunch of IBMers then in supply chain technology. Actually, it's all IBMers except for Jeffrey. Polyak, because the two other people are not there. I'm just watching the, the clock waiting for it to turn to 1044. Uh, looks like there's a minute countdown. So they're coming back in in a minute. Let me tell Dan. Great. Five seconds. Welcome back. Dan, you're on mute. Sorry. Uh, we had a robust discussion uh, in our group. I hope I, I got some uh, feedback that there was good, good chats going on all around. Um, so we're going to do some report outs um, so that Rob can take all of our wisdom and hear directly from you um, uh, what you came up with. And then uh, we'll, of course, as I said earlier, uh, work with you as we go forward. So uh, I think the first group up is the uh, issues group, issues and process, which Karen, I think, is, is your team, correct? Yes, but uh, Dan's going to do the readout. Okay, that's great. And by the way, feel free to continue using the chat as people brief out with thoughts and reactions. Rob, uh, do that readout. I'm sorry. <clears throat> sorry? I, I was saying Dan was going to do the readout. I was looking at you, but Rob is going to do the readout. No, from no that's great. Uh, but I just want, I was making a general comment. Feel to everybody to continue using the chat um, for questions, comments, thoughts uh, as we go through the readouts. Um, so, Rob, over to you. Rob, you're on mute. Thank you. So, yeah, our, our, uh, the supply chain issues group, we, we, uh, we jumped around a good bit. Um, you know, 1 of the things that that we, we identified right away is. You know, the, a data issue, uh, you know, getting access to data means that, uh. We need to have, we need to start cleansing the data. Uh, and, and that's, that's a critical, a critical point. Um, we made the point we don't have to get all of the data. We just need to identify what data is, is going to be really, really important. And um, uh, 
you know, Jerry McGinn made, made a, you know, a, a lot of effort uh, or descriptions around the fact of, you know, improving communications across agencies is, is, is always been a, ch a challenge. It's, it may not be something that we uh, be, can, can fix, but that it is something that uh, certainly needs to be considered as, as one of the criteria uh, in whatever solution we, uh, we start thinking about. Um, you know, we identified the fact that onshoring, you know, is is a related issue. There may be multiple objectives going on, so we need to clearly define, um, you know, what, who's responsible and is that really a core part of our decision here? We debated that for a little bit. And uh, then we talked about really the importance of, of, of signals. Um, uh, you know, a lot, a lot of the processes and the uh, intelligence mechanisms for uh, medical warning uh, are are there. I mean, they're documented. Um, you know, J Jim Wilson shared with us some of his insights about how uh, how they were able to get some of the early warning uh, indicators uh, for COVID and were able to communicate that to uh, uh, you know an organization in, in Nevada, a, a private sector or a, or, or a hospital sector organization. Uh, we we talked about the idea of. You know, what would be the right vehicle for uh, doing that, that medical warning? We talked about maybe Northcom or an equivalent. Um, and then getting the signals and starting to build up perhaps a tabletop exercise to help define what are the critical materials that we need to be paying attention to in the supply chain. And then being able to, uh, to identify, um, you know, what that information or, or how, how to get better visibility into that information. We, we talked a little bit about the, the challenges of uh, data sharing that, that uh, during COVID, we didn't see hospitals sharing a lot of information and, and maybe over inflating what their needs and requirements were. Uh, and so we'll have to give some thought as to how to, you know, use perhaps CMS as the leverage point for uh, getting better data from our hospital network globe uh, across the country and, and be able to, uh, you know, link that back to a, a, a strategic plan that is then linked to the incoming material uh, insights that we're getting on uh, these new pathogens that are that are potentially on the horizon. So, so it's, it's kind of a big picture still uh, view that we were talking about. I, I think we have some work to do uh, to be able to think about how to filter that into a, uh, a, a manageable plan. Uh, thanks, Rob and team. Uh, I've covered a lot of ground. Uh, any questions or comments for either from your team uh, or from from others who were in the group or in other groups? Uh, I would note that your your point about um, sort of capacity building. We talked about that in policy as well. That I'll I'll come back to in terms of linking foresight uh, into that that framework as well. All right. Well, thanks. A big hand to the to the issues team. Um, so let's all go to technology. Margie, uh, are you presenting or is there a team member? You're on mute. I'll start and then I'll let my team members join in uh, because these are their ideas that they were generating. So um, uh, first up, uh, Jeff was talking about the need for the standardization of data. I, I'm starting to see some themes and threads we can pull here from what Rob was just talking about that are common, uh, and that is the standardization of data and the importance of information sharing. It's all about the data and being able to exchange in these environments uh, and no strong governance that's running over the top of that that ensures that kind of, of efficacy and uh, cleansing and um, appropriateness of the data so that good decisions can be made. Uh, and then Nikki started talking about um, how you can uh, use AI to cut down and rationalize some of that data uh, to actually derive actionable insights and information from it. Uh, we talked about the fact that uh, the data can live where it lives and we can use some technical tools to roll over the top of that and actually derive those insights. Uh, Monique was talking about the um, early warning shortages and uh, not only in SNS, but also food deserts, PPE and medical devices. Um, we saw in this uh, particular case, 
that uh, we couldn't get food to the right places at the right time, that it actually existed, but we couldn't get it to the demand uh, because suddenly it went from the demand being mostly restaurants to the demand being more about uh, people in their homes. Uh, so being able to um, address that and model that is absolutely key. Uh, we need to get um, state and local areas that are not normally on our radar into this equation and to have end-to-end -end supply chain visibility and the simulations uh, that we can be able to do digital twinning uh, for being able to identify uh, when one supply chain is cut off, uh, what's the next tier two or tier three? Uh, vendors don't even know that within their own auspices, but we should be able to predict that across uh, multiple geographic areas. And we talked a little bit about um, the criticality, availability, and sole source and capacity for specific items. Uh, those that are critical for either national defense or capability that need to be kept in business even when they're not being utilized. So uh, piece parts for, for uh, airplanes and things of that nature, um, some kinds of, um, of chips and capability. And that scenario planning for American companies has to have supporting factors in the procurement arena where there needs to be clauses in our procurement contracts uh, that require that people identify those second and third tier uh, supply chain capabilities and be able to model those in case we need to uh, activate in, a, in an emergency situation. And then I want to open it up to my uh, team members to see if they want to add to that equation. Anything else from Margie's team? I'll jump in. We really spent a lot of time talking about modeling. Right? I yeah. mean, these digital twin technology to be able mm -hmm. to model these scenarios two at a time, three at a time, and be on offense instead of reactive defense is critical. Good. And in order to do that, you have to see it. You have to understand what your entire supply chain looks like. And so much right now, the, or especially within the government and within industry, um, organizations cannot, you know, they, they think they can see all of their tier one, but they probably don't see all of the locations for all their parts and products are coming from even at the tier one space much less a tier two or tier three um and when being able to it, once you have that visibility then you can build the model and then you can run scenarios against it um but you, you have to be able to pull that information together um and it's not just important for the government to understand that but if the government's going to protect industry as well and part of its job is supporting the american people and american businesses um they need to be able to see that as well. Um, one of the examples I threw out is like, what if there's a Chinese embargo on Taiwan? Um, it's not going to just impact the federal government and parts and products that we have coming in to defense supply and, and fed sieve, but it's also going to greatly impact American industry um, yeah. and all the products that are coming in that way. And so it's, you know, it's part of the government's job to not just protect its own supply chain, but the supply chain of the uh, American economy. So. Yeah. So that's an interesting uh, and foreseeable um, uh, crisis <laughs> we can, that we, you know, it, we're, we're dealing with. Okay, well, thanks to um, team technology. Um, so I'll quickly kind of wrap up with our uh, discussion around policy. We, we talked uh, a bit in uh, terms of the current state um, around uh, the need for that. Right now we've got, we've got some management protocols, some cr cross agency protocols. Um, in existing interagency councils, OMB has processes to kind of navigate policy development and implementation. Um, uh, we don't really have a management plan for supply chain, if you will. Um, uh, and uh, we, we um, uh, need that management structure. The third point here is on foresight. Uh, we don't necessarily have a, we do have a foresight community of interest. It's not well connected to uh, risk management or operational uh, readiness issues. And so that's a, a, a factor that we talked about. Some elements of future state were um, take advantage of commercial supply chain capabilities as a government. There's a lot of success in, in sort of the global supply chain efforts, uh, you know, examples of governments riding on company trucks uh, around the world. I talked about one that we had studied uh, recently. Uh, quick response contracting capability to build in, build on things like OTAs to be able to respond quickly, like the OTA that was used to develop vaccine distribution. Um, as part of that uh, process. And then Lori talked about uh, the data standards and approach that the shared services teams are taking now 
again, could be emulated in establishing this sort of supply chain readiness uh, capability uh, for the future that could help uh, inter inform both operations and also, as Tammy talked about with her role at FDA, kind of regulatory insight in terms of incentivizing or disincentivizing the um, market players. And then finally, um, critical success factors, we talked about the authority to act quickly, uh, the need to um, uh, have the, both the political will and the structures to be able to, to put in place um, a, a rapid response capability. You know, do you have something in the White House like Jeff Science has now, like Ed Sev had for recovery, as opposed to relying on an agency? And then do you set things up ex ante so that you can quickly ramp up to that type of capability rather than have to invent, invent it each time? Uh, and then we, um, again, talked about sort of sourcing supply with industry, not having the government have to develop its own supply chain inventory, but work with industry to, to bring in supplies quickly and, and ramp up in a particular, particular situation, because we'll never be able to boil the ocean or anticipate everything going forward. Even if we get, even with perfect foresight, um, we're going to still have those black swan events. Um, so any other um, comments from our team? Okay, it sounds like I got all the major, major issues. So, um, uh, Rob, you've heard everything. We've got two minutes left. Any final thoughts from you before we say goodbye and thank you? No, the, the, these were excellent, uh, really excellent insights. I appreciate everyone's uh, input today. Uh, it really generated a lot of interesting ideas. Um, you know, I, I think one of the one of the lessons learned from the current state is. You know, the government did rely on um, the commercial sector on distributors uh, in this case, and uh, they failed um, and they, uh, they did so because they were reliant on uh, Chinese exports that were cut off um, because China had their own, uh, th their own, you know, uh, particular uh, objectives in mind. So I, I think we need one of the characteristics of any solution, I think, is that we have to become more independent. We have to, and I'm not sure it's an onshoring capability. We have to find a way to become more independent and, uh, and, and be able to build partnerships with uh, countries and nations that I think are, uh, are, are more capable of being able to supply us. Uh, one of the obvious ones that I, I think we did not talk about here was uh, was Mexico. Uh, Mexico is a source of low cost manufacturing, and I'm a big fan of uh, you know building a supply chain with Mexico, and um, I think that's something that we could explore. Maybe maybe that's a different uh, a different workshop that we have at some point in the future, Dan. So thanks everyone again. All right. Well, thank you, Rob. Thanks to all of you. I know a number of folks had to leave. They'd let us know that they had uh, a commitment to between 10 and 10.30. So thanks to those of you that have heard the uh, wisdom uh, through to the end. Uh, John Marshall, I'm going to give you the last word. Dan, I'm going to thank you and the IBM team for a, a masterful job in facilitating this discussion and pulling together this really impressive uh, collection of, uh, of thinkers on these issues. And I think we generated all the raw material we need today for a uh, very impressive and uh, and helpful report. So very much looking forward to the next steps. Okay, thank you. And again, we'll be supplying you all with drafts. We'll probably do a quick blog post with high level insights that John and I'll author in, in the coming weeks. And then Rob will be working, uh, uh, working this in between his teaching responsibilities um, to develop a, a, a report. So thanks again to Rob. Thanks to all of you. Have a great day and a great weekend and a happy Thanksgiving. Thank, Thank you, Dan. Good job for pulling this together. Thanks, yep. Thanks very much. Bye bye. Bye. Thanks a lot. Bye. bye. bye.